do you want to do what we do? Literally this, podcasting, editing audio on your own time, making fun little episodes about your favorite topics? Well, we can help you out. Sound Studio 4 is an app for Mac that lets you record music, create sound effects, digitize old records and tapes, or even create your own podcast, like George said. Just don't make it about sound. We're kind of already doing that. And it's pretty okay. (laughs) Sound Studio 4 is the latest version of their software. It's been around since 1999, and this current version has bells and whistles to help make whatever audio project you want. You can find Sound Studio 4 in the Mac App Store or at macsoundstudio.com. Ignition sequence start. Five. Everything. Three. Everything. Sounds. Sounds. This is Everything Sounds. I'm Craig Shank. I'm George Drake Jr. And this is Everything Sounds. One of my favorite aspects about my grandfather was his brutal honesty. My grandmother was a fiercely loyal person. There's a beach in the town next to mine called Tower Beach. The road it's on and the beach itself were named because of their landmark, a giant white tower. It's not a tower, it's a smokestack. But when I was a kid, I thought it was a lighthouse. My grandparents lived on Mill Street, which was about 15 minutes away from our house. In the mornings before school, my parents would drop me off so they could go to work, and I'd wait with my grandmother for the school bus. I dreamt up a scenario where I grew up in the lighthouse with another family, and then was adopted by my actual family. It was an innocent fiction at first, but I had thought about it so frequently that I actually started to believe it. I was a shy kid that mostly kept to myself, but on the bus, it's pretty hard to keep to yourself. When an older kid started picking on people, eventually he made his way to me. Being a skinny kid with big glasses and a dinosaur t-shirt made me a pretty easy target. One Sunday, my grandfather and I were returning from a round of golf. He always took side streets back to avoid the church traffic, and eventually we made our way back to Tower Road. We hung a left, And there it was, my lighthouse. One day when I came home from school, I told my parents that I was being picked on during bus rides. My grandmother found out and she decided she could help find a solution for the problem. We were driving straight towards the tower and I thought to myself, I wonder if Papu knows about my other life. I should probably let him know if he doesn't. I ate my breakfast and watched cartoons and I thought, What's going to happen on the bus today? What could anyone do to help? I took a breath. I looked at my lighthouse. I looked at my grandfather, looked back at my lighthouse and said, did you know that I actually grew up in that lighthouse? I sat on the porch and waited for the bus while my grandmother's car was running in the driveway. As the bus turned the corner, my grandma went to the curb and the door of the bus opened up. My grandfather looked at me the third George in a line of Georges, he looked at the smokestack that clearly wasn't a lighthouse. He looked back at me, his namesake, and said, no you didn't. She stepped onto the bus and started yelling at the kid who had been picking on me. She got off the bus and we followed it all the way to school in her car while she stared and pointed at that one kid every time he looked out of the back window at me. He never bothered me again. When the people we love pass away, these are the kinds of stories that we remember to help keep their memory alive. My grandfather passed away in the fall of 2009, and stories of his honesty are still told at family dinners. It's been years since she passed away, but my family still tells stories about my grandma cheating in card games and making perfect grilled cheese sandwiches. These stories are still fresh in our minds. We live through them, or we know the people that did. However, some stories are heard and told less as time goes on, and eventually, 
they just stop being told forever. But sometimes those stories can be revived, reimagined, or maybe even discovered for the very first time. In 2012, Simon Newton and his father did a little bit of research into a notorious relative of their own. Your granny has a letter written in 1822 uh, by uh, Anne Broughton. She wrote this back to her husband, who was a, who was still working as a surgeon in, in Leicester, telling him and everything that's, she, she that's was Spence doing. That's Spence Jr. That's Spence Jr. That's right. So we have an actual document, handwritten document, dated 1822, and it connects us directly to Spence Broughton, the High Woman. When my dad began to research our family history about ten years ago. He traced an ancestry of people who had lived and worked in Britain and abroad. Cornish sea captains, bookbinders in 19th century London, wool merchants and solicitors and joiners from Leicester to Lowestoft. Their stories told by a trail of birth, marriage and death certificates. And up came all these references to hanging and high women, and I just couldn't believe it at the, t- at the time when I saw this. I thought, what? This, this can't be, this can't be us, we can't be connected. Then he discovered one contributor to our DNA, born in 1746, whose name appeared in newspapers, poems and songs. So we've got physical proof that my distant ancestor is Spence Broughton, a legendary highwayman. Not legendary, an actual highwayman. So, and he is your great, 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 great grandfather, without any doubt. To you, my dear companions, accept these lines, I pray. A most impartial trial has been occupied this day. Tis from your dying Broughton to show his wretched fate. Pray make your reformation before it is too late. He went to Sheffield, where, on the outskirts of town, opposite the arena, the Noose and Gibbet Inn displays an effigy of Spence Broughton, highwayman. From here, I'm going to let the people who know it best tell his story. Well, my understanding is that he was from farming stock, but he developed an urge to gamble. I'm I'm Mel Jones, and uh, I'm a landscape historian, a local historian. Not only cards, but cockfighting and I understand he came to Sheffield for cockfighting and he had a mate with him John Oxley. Spence Broughton um, was born in 1740s in Lincolnshire son of a farmer and I think was quite um, well to do Um, but at some point he became involved in gambling circles and um, he hooked up with uh, various uh, unsavoury people in uh, in the Midlands and North Midlands and also in London. I'm Rob Hindle and I'm here in the Sheffield Botanical Gardens. I'm going to read some short extracts, poems from a sequence, The Purging of Spence Broughton, a Highwayman, which led to uh, the point where I became interested in the story in that he and an accomplice allegedly robbed uh, the, the Rotherham mail. And th- they wanted to uh, get the bonds, basically, that were um, sent via the mail, launder them, and I think really help their, their gambling habits. And the reason why it was such a big deal to rob the mail coach is that that was the main means of communication for all this money and for business. But it would have been very quiet. There'd been the odd horse and cart coming along. And if you if you walked out of Sheffield and noticed the the mail cart coming one direction and there was no one about, I'd imagine that it would put an idea into certain people's heads. So the thing then would be to think, now, it's on a regular route, so we'll find a place to hide, it's quiet, we can lead him off the road and see what he's got on the cart, and there'll be no problem. And it seems that Spence Broughton, um, although he was with his accomplice, John Oxley, he was the one that actually disguised himself with a, a, a rural smock and a, uh, and a funny countryman's hat, uh, approached the mailboy, stopped him, told him to get down from the horse and 
having tied him up, uh, made off with the, uh, with, with the money. And they set off to London to try to get it changed. It was a bill of, uh, bill of exchange. It wasn't cash. They must have been doubly disappointed. And they set off for London and eventually they got it changed and he was, he was arrested, taken to York. Unfortunately for Spence, one of his um, co-conspirators turned evidence on him and the other one did that as well but also escaped. So those two never were brought to justice and Spence got the full punishment. He uh, ended up in, uh, in the court, the, the Crown Court in York, in March 1792 in front of Justice Buller. The evidence was given and he was uh, sentenced by Buller and not just to be hanged but to be hanged and then for his body to be taken to Attercliffe Common, uh, very specifically to, uh, to the place near where the robbery had taken place, as a warning to others. And the judge said his body should swing between heaven and earth as being... Spence Broughton, you have been convicted of a crime that must have been long premeditated and which in its consequence has been most baneful to society. Of a crime that should leave you without a shadow of hope that you could receive any mercy on this side of the grave. In order to deter others, your punishment should not cease at the place of execution. Your body shall be afterwards suspended between heaven and earth as unworthy of either to be buffeted about by the winds and the storms. You shall be taken to the place from whence you came and thence to a place of lawful execution. And there you shall be hanged by the neck until you be dead, and afterwards to be hung in chains on the common within three miles of Sheffield. And may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Uh, my name is Ian Rotherham. I'm Professor of Environmental Geography at Sheffield Hallam University. There's a pub public spectacle as part of it, and people would turn up for a good hanging or a good gibbeting or stuff like that. In Spence Broughton's case, you know, apparently from what we were discussing earlier, we got 40,000 people the next day. You know, so it's a big tourism event. So, and the authorities would want that. That sort of almost takes the steam out of things. It lets things, um, it gives them a degree of satisfaction, like a bloodlust, if you like. Spence was held here until, I think it was February 1792, at which time he would have been taken from his cell onto the back of a cart. The back of the cart would have also have his uh, coffin and it would be followed by any mourners that he had. Broughton was held at York Castle. Now the York Castle Museum, tour guide Dave Cree took us through his last days. At St Tyburn, you could have been expecting to see crowds of as many as 20 or 30,000 people. The authorities attracted them here to act as a deterrent, to put them off crime for themselves. But of course the general public saw it more as an attraction than a deterrent. Normal execution, he would climb the ladder, the rope around, around his neck and a hood over his head. The jailer there, or the executioner then would twist the ladder out of the man's uh, grasp, leaving him suspended. It would then take usually about 25 minutes in which to die of asphyxiation. These last acts are casting out. His tongue grows hard and round and thrusts from his mouth. His eyes ogle. His hands, bound with a bit of twine, make claws and point at the ground. His cock stiffens, shoots a last fusillade in his breeches. The bones of his feet make the dance of the tarantella with such wild frenzy, the noose at his neck shuts tight as a clam. So he is carted back to the place of his crime. The last foot of rope left on him, stuck out and jagged like a birth cord. 
There are major forces at play in the 16, 17, 1800s. And across Europe, you've got insurrection, you've got you know, the French Revolution, you've got changes in philosophy, in the economy, and you've also got this huge process of urbanisation. So the first time, really within living memory, people are coming into big urban areas, they're leaving the countryside, and these are what the authorities tended to describe as masterless men. So they are starting to get really worried that you've got this huge number of generally poor people in these urban areas without any control, in the absence of control. You know, you haven't got a modern contemporary police system, for example. So they're frightened. And the fact that the guy was hanged in 1792 when revolution in France was turning to terror and the authorities in Britain were running scared, really, you know, was this a man who was hanged for his crime on its own merits or as a message to say, you know, watch out. If anybody fancies having a go, then this is what happens. The lesson for other peoples, they didn't have asbos in those days, but the next thing to do, of course, is to have an example. So they have the gibbet. Manufacture of the gibbet iron. They have been up all night, bending the rolled iron, hammering the rivets in. Now it hangs on its hook, turning idly in the first light. Against the black bricks, the forged outline of a man. Um, I'm Clara Morgan, I'm the curator of social history at Museum Sheffield. Um, I look after the social history collection, and within that collection we have these supposed gibbet chains from Sprint's Broughton. They're actually, I mean, you can see there's a, um, a set of manacles with a chain, and they're quite wide, so if they are his, they're probably for his legs rather than his arms. But, but this round belt type thing with the little um, chains coming off it is maybe from the cage that held him, because, he, you know, if you imagine a gibbet cage shape, like a little dome. So the body was taken from York, uh, from the York Tyburn. There his body was taken up, put on a gibbet, a sort of restraining iron, as a, as a I suppose, a warning to uh, people on the road. And in the dead of night, they hoisted up his body, which had been probably tarred all over to, um, to preserve it. And it hanged there, as far as I'm aware, for about 35 years until the new landowner thought it was an eyesore and demanded that it was taken down. He didn't murder anybody, um, and they just started to see his body hanging up there and slowly rotting away on Attercliffe Common and, and felt sorry for him, so he became a folk hero, really. And of course, folklore thickens, and people write ballads uh, and poems, and, and people talk in families. I mean, people couldn't read in those days, everything was passed on orally. And, and these oral records go on and on and on. If only I had taken ship to some far distant climb. The gibbet post for Broughton would never have been mine But now I am bound down in chains And I am cast to die Take pity on my grievous state All you who do pass by There's a green man on the field. His eyes are big as bonfires and his mouth is wide. He watches me and shouts at me. And there are curling shoots in his mouth and eyes and ears. His belly is split. Dark roots are spilled from it. I, I am afraid of that green man. Now, that, that's really weaving a web, isn't it? But there we are, you know. I mean, if, if people will sort of show gibbets and have bodies hanging on them, it's bound to bring about myth and legend and folklore and all the rest of it. I never should have come to this had I stayed at home with you. 
Well, it's it's a great story, and it actually makes me feel, in a way, proud. Farewell, farewell, forever. Spence Broughton is no more. Spence Broughton. Part of the rich tapestry of of English life that takes us, in this case, 220 years back into the past. Simon's dad, Tim, has done further research into Spence Broughton, and he intends to write what he calls a short book on his life, sometime in the near future. For now, we have pictures and links to the songs and poems and all of their other findings, tons of findings, at our website, everythingsounds.org. We also have links to Simon's other work there as well. We're brought to you with support from Sound Studio 4 for Mac. If you want to record and edit audio, you can find this affordable option at MacSoundStudio.com, and maybe you can use it to preserve your own family stories. That's Sound Studio 4 for Mac at MacSoundStudio.com. Everything Sounds is a part of the Mule Radio Syndicate, along with other shows like Here Be Monsters, Evening Edition, and plenty of other great podcasts. You can find them all along with the Mule Radio app at MuleRadio.net. We have all of the episodes of Everything Sounds at soundcloud.com slash everything sounds. And you can find us on all of the other social media sites as well, like Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. We've got links to all of those at everythingsounds.org. Thanks for listening. I'm Craig Shank. And I'm George Drake Jr. This is Everything Sounds. <laughs>